Hello, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds on this Monday, November 22nd. Um, as always, it is a pleasure uh, to have everyone joining us from all corners of the health system, and uh, particularly a pleasure to have our special guest, Dr. Moises Alron, who is um, MedPeds trained, which always makes me uh, makes me happy to hear, and a professor of both medicine and pediatrics. Um, also a great person to follow on Twitter, who I think was tweeting like right up until he joined us today. Um, so good to know, uh, good to know what he's up to even when he's not speaking to us from Cleveland. Uh, Dr. Aron, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Weisman. Um, thank you, Dr. Steinberg and Dr. Mitaka. It is an honor and pleasure to be here. Thank you for the very kind invitation. Um, it is a highlight in my career to be here with you today. So what we'll be speaking about is a high value approach to the use of blood, especially uh, red blood cells, fresh frozen plasma and platelets. I have, um, oh, let me see here, okay, yeah, continue, sure. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. I am the blood management medical director at Cleveland Clinic. And um, I became like this because of my interest in blood management since um, late 2000s. Uh, when I saw that uh, there was an overuse of blood transfusions, they were transfusing two units at a time, when in my training in Metro Health, we were using one unit at a time, we were ahead of the game. And also, I saw they were transfusing for hemoglobin of 11, or I said, why are they doing this? So I found that Cleveland Clinic was actually the highest blood utilizer in the country in the early 2000s. So this led to very strong quality improvement and we have moved the way the needle all the way to the other side, where we actually even have open heart surgery in Jehovah Witness patients, and we do not use blood at all. So it has led us to innovate and focus on high value care. The brief outline of the lecture will speak very briefly about some elements that are very important to understand the rationale for parsimonious blood utilization, then the evidence for transfusion medicine and the adverse uh, effects of blood use. And then we'll conclude with protocols for optimizing anemia. And by the end, we'll speak about FFP and platelets. So we have a case. This is a patient who was supposed to have a surgery in March 2020. I use the context of COVID because it became very germane for this lecture. Hemoglobin was eight. And the anesthesiologist wanted to transfuse a patient with the rationale to optimize oxygen delivery. The reason for our disagreement would be based on the hemoglobin threshold, optimization of preload or oxygenation for all of the above. So this slide is very important. This slide uh, is basically uh, what we, I use all the time in, uh, with my, my restaurant. Understanding that oxygen delivery, you will have different components rather than just on blood by cardiac output, which will be stroke volume and heart rate, you have to determine the physiologic element that impacts on this. I decrease uh, treat sepsis, treat fever, treat thyroid disease, improve volume. In, I mean, you want to find out that you stroke volume, well, you have the component preload, afterload, and contractility. I mean, optimize preload, uh, decrease afterload, improve contractility, find out. I mean, sepsis, treating sepsis treats all of these things making sure you treat anxiety, you treat pain, you treat fever, and so forth to decrease oxygen consumption. But more importantly, when you look at arterial content of oxygen, you will know that this is going to be the product of your saturation of oxygen, who will be determining your oxygenation, times the amount of oxygen per gram of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is a single value here, but we can still focus on BQ mismatch, we can focus on shunt, we can co focus on diffusion problems. We can focus on hypoventilation. We can focus on decreased FiO2. So there are many elements that we can improve acutely rather than just transducing the patient in an indiscriminate fashion. Therefore, all of the above will be the response to this answer. The surgery is postponed. Surgeon determines to replace imatinic parenterally with IV iron and IMB12. Hemoglobin rises up. What are the outcomes of doing this? Well, first of all, we need to realize that our patient population is going to be aging. And the older they get, there's going to be a high, higher prevalence of anemia. And actually, even male patients 
will have a higher prevalence as compared with the female counterpart. In this cohort of 227,000 patients, where almost 70,000 had preopanemia, that was not optimized, it had a 35 to 40 percent increase in mortality and morbidity as compared with the non-anemic counterparts. Now, this is fascinating. This is in cardiac surgery patients. When we compare the patients who have no anemia versus anemia, but even among each group, we found the ones that have no iron deficiency and the patients who have iron deficiency. And we see that iron deficiency by itself in any of the cohort, even the non-anemic patient, is associated with worse outcomes. And you can see that in this slide, where all of the outcomes are actually statistically significant. Increased mortality, serious adverse event, major adverse cardiac event, transfusion, and transition of all different types of products. Now, this is very important for us as hospitalists and um, in the perioperative setting. This is a study from the Cleveland Clinic, where they found that in your third day post-op, the lowest hemoglobin value you have correlate with the risk, the risk of myocardial infarction in non-cardiac surgery, or actually called like MINS. And you can see that for every gram uh, per deciliar of hemoglobin that goes down by uh, below 10, you increase by 29 to 34% your risk of uh, mean both in hostel and a month after the operation. So this has led to recommendation. This is one from the Society for Advancement of Patient Blood Management, where they recommend do not proceed with elective surgery unless you, until you have optimized anemia. Here's my take on this. And this is something that even internists, we do not do well. We think that anemia is a disease. Anemia is not a disease. Anemia is a manifestation of an underlying process, which could be a genetic thing, or it could be a deficiency of hematinic, or it could be blood loss, or there's something that leads to the development of anemia. So the, the most important thing is I've seen this all, all the time in my patient who said, oh, anemia is stable. Yeah, but why is the patient anemic? So we need to find out and optimize those things. So all of the above will be the result of this process. So I have told you so far that preoperative anemia increases morbidity and mortality, and not just preop anemia, it's in all contexts. So what should be the best code of value to transfuse? Should be the 1030? The 1030 or hemoglobin of 10 and the hematocrit of 30 came from studies in the late 1930s by Dr. Adam and Lundy. Those were OBGYN, and they did the experiments in dogs. And that led to the whole rest of the century to the use of, of a transition. And still today, 2021, there's many places that still use those core values. So the NIH came up with a consensus and basically in 2018 saying that the hemoglobin of less than 10 or a crit less than 30 uh, is what indicates the need for transfusion. However, most patients rarely need pre transfusion. And they say, where is? Though with acute anemia and hemoglobin value less than seven, and they have a mistake here, will more frequently need blood. So they also stated a change in the paradigm. Look for all the physiologic causes that could be optimized instead. So this led to the normal volemic hemodilution studies, where patients were subjected to blood loss, acute blood loss of 250 to 500 ml dropping the hemoglobin from 12 or 13 all the way down to eight. These were in people with coronary artery disease. These were in elderly patients, healthy elderly patients. These were in elderly patients who were uh, having cardiac disease that were stable. And they focused on changes in the ST segment, the EKG, changes in the cardiac index, changes in the anaerobic threshold and so forth. And they were able to demonstrate that patients uh, could tolerate anemia in an acute way without a, a significant change in hemodynamics. So when we look at, uh, at this study in younger people focusing on mathematical operations, those patients had a baseline hemoglobin of 14 and they were uh, hemodiluted down to seven. And you can see for the speed of reaction for all different mathematics operations on an hemoglobin of seven were very similar to higher level hemoglobin. So what does this led is that when the patient were hemodiluted down to six, 
they have a lag in response in all operations and even further where they went down to five. When they recovered down to seven, the speed of reaction actually improved, except for numeric substitution, there was still a lag in, in response. So basically, this showed that there was no difference in time of reaction with a, high, a hemoglobin of 14 versus seven. And this is uh, the background that supports the code of value of seven for most patients. Now, we are comparing patients that were on trial. Does so this compare in real life with a real life patient? So this led to all these different trials. If you want to memorize one, one trial, you have just to memorize the trick trial. And basically what they did, they compared what was the outcomes of patients when they transfused them to keep the hemoglobin above nine versus seven or eight. So a restrictive trial. And they found in the trick trial, higher threshold actually led to worse outcomes. But then you have different clinical scenarios that you can, uh, you can use. You have in surgical patients, focused trial in elderly orthopedic surgery in high cardiovascular risk patients. They have, they use a core value of eight and they have the same outcomes. You have GI bleeding. We have the Villanueva study in Barcelona. That's the seminal one that showed that the patient who gets transfused with a higher threshold, they actually do worse if you use a core value of seven. And the most recent ones have been done in cardiac surgery patients and going even to more conservative values of 7.5, where the patients are actually having a very similar outcome to higher threshold. Even more, higher threshold gets worse risk of um, worse prognosis as restrictive threshold. So this, so this slide is pretty, pretty important because it helps us summarize very compelling evidence that you can use in any different discussion with so many providers that are skeptical about restrictive value to support their evidence. They say, well, when my patients are, I mean, I present this lecture multiple times in different countries in Latin America. And people tell me, well, but my patients are sicker. I said, no, your patient cannot be sicker than the focus trial. Your patient cannot be sicker than the trick trial. If you look at those trials, I mean, those patients were really sick. Your patient cannot be sick. Uh, we, we have like inceptic chocolate, the whole story. Those were really sick patients and those real life patients. So it's important to acknowledge and we change the behavior day by day. So what does the guideline state? They recommend restrictive threshold, hemoglobin of seven for most patients or eight for people with active cardiovascular disease, actually active coronary artery disease or ortho or cardiac surgery. An important thing not to forget is common sense. This does not apply for acute coronary syndrome. This does not apply for patients who have chemotherapy and they leave from the transfusion. So we have a patient um, that comes to our service, got a surgery, required three units of blood. The iron torsion are low and hemoglobin is 7.1. What should be the next thing to do? Well, the question is focus on the number of units that you must use before harm can actually be caused to the patient. And you have a variety of scenarios. You have the ICU patients, you have the American College of Surgeons National Surgical Quality Improvement Performance Database, and you have the premier claim database. This is a study by Dr. Auerbach and the Auerbach from UCSF. And you see that when you use more than four units, there's an increased risk of mortality. There's an increased risk of infection. There's an increased risk of length of stay. And there's, of course, an increased risk of both stroke and myocardial infarction. So there's, when my patient comes transferred to my service from ICU or other services, and they have required blood, a question I ask, let's document how many units of blood has that patient received so far, why? Because if the patient has received four or more, they have a higher risk of bad outcomes. And we have to focus very strongly and ensure that we optimize other things so that the patient do not get increased infection, they do not get, of course, increased risk of mor morbidity or mortality. And we try to optimize um, their discharge. Now, also, when we transfuse, we should transfuse one unit at a time because the higher risk of transfusion is this, transfusion-associated circulatory overload. 
that's the highest risk of transmission. This is way, way, way more than viral infection. I often see my resident explaining the patient when they are requesting to the, the informed consent, oh, you have a high, some risk, very small risk, negligible risk of HIV, hepatitis C. I said, no, I mean, the viral infection, the risk of getting a viral infection is the same as crashing in a plane. The same as getting hit by a lightning. I mean, it's very, very low. What you need to focus your conversation is, we are going to transfuse you, but we have a risk of um, giving you too much volume. So we may need to give you a diuretic to flush the excess of volume out and protect your kidney. Remember, there's also something we call now nephrosarca, like anasarca of the kidney. The kidney gets puffy too, and that squishes the vein, that squishes all the intrinsic system, and that can also cause acute kidney injury. So we have to be coach. We are changing our paradigms in medicine, and it's just so fascinating. So replacing hematinics and evaluating for source control will be our key management here. So far, I have told you that anemia it's associated with worse outcomes, and blood use is also associated with blood outcomes. So what we need to do? Well, what we have to do is understanding that anemia is not a disease. Anemia is a consequence of an underlying process, and we have to optimize it. So this is a picture of a cave in Iceland. These are iron deposits. To make it a little bit more, more fun for the lecture. So this is a reference that I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend all of you to download. This is from Anesthesia and Analgesia 2020. This is up to today, November 22, 2021. It's the single best reference you can use for perioperative anemia. I'm not referring you to my own papers, okay? I'm referring you to this one. This is an incredible reference. And the most important thing is they evaluate the patient to have anemia. The, most, the single first is iron stores. And if you want to memorize something, is this, this little square here. Transferring saturation less than 20%, iron deficiency anemia. Ferritin less than 100, or a reticulocyte hemoglobin content less than 30%. So these are the things, this is the most common cause for anemia. If these are okay, then they look for B12 or a folate. If they're low, they repeat it. If they're normal, then you focus on anemia of chronic inflammation or anemia of end-stage renal disease. Soon after that uh, study was published, I mean, the review article was published, there was a guideline for iron deficiency anemia by AGA. And the evidence is, I mean, as any guideline, is, is, is relatively weak, but it's the strongest that is available. But this, these guidelines are very important because they change the paradigm to approach iron deficiency anemia. We used to do only a colonoscopy. Now they're actually recommending to do bidirectional endoscopy at the same time an EGD and a colonoscopy. And if there's no finding, they recommend to replete with iron rather than the capsule. This changed my paradigm. I, mean, I was always, always using myself since I started working in 2007 by directional endoscopy, always. But the way it, it happened is I put the order for the EGD to be relative. So we start with the colonoscopy. If the colonoscopy is positive, then we stop the EGD. If the colonoscopy is negative, then we do the EGD. And I, and I also had a third year that if the EGD was negative, then do a capsule. Was well, now, uh, well, they don't do the capsule because they want to do the, re the replacement of iron first. And it's okay, I think that's reasonable. It's a high value care approach. Now, what happened with iron? I mean, IV iron has been is something that has, people dread because we have been talked that Iron is, is really bad, because of anaphylaxis. We have compelling evidence. I mean, the most recent study on the TV found that serious hypersensitivity reaction happened in less than 1.7% of patients. The safest profile of iron is actually iron sucrose. That's the safest of all of them. Now, this is a story that by Stojanovic that was published, uh, now it's going to be two years ago, of almost uh, 13,000 13, infusions. 1.4 of the infusion has some reaction. Now, among those 195, they recommend that in almost 100 patients. 33, of, 33 patients, they recommend the, the baseline infusion, and, they, and the 69 were re-challenged. And this is what you have to know. The fish vein reaction, the transient flushing and truncal myalgia, 
that's what most of the patients have, and that's an anaphylactoid reaction, not anaphylactic, anaphylactoid reaction. The mild is defined by some localized cutaneous manifestation, and the moderate when they have some GI upset, maybe some transient hypotension or tachycardia. On this patient, they were able to tolerate or re-challenge. The, the main issue with this is that we should not label, uh, unless you have high and respiratory symptoms, then you should not label that an allergy. You could potentially give the patient a different hydramine, acetaminophen, maybe steroids, and rechallenge with a slower rate of infusion. Most of the patient actually tolerate it. And we have done a big change here in the Cleveland Clinic because uh, the nurses in the infusion centers used to label this patient as allergic, and therefore we lost a huge opportunity to optimize them. So, this is a very nice story about what is the impact of replacing iron. So when we replace iron, often we replace iron one gram at a time. Most recent guidelines suggest that you can go up to 1.5 grams. Basically, there's a formula called the Gansoni formula where you can calculate. In reality, anybody with an hemoglobin of 10 or less at least have a gram of iron deficiency in the body. So replacing, replacing the iron in any way you want will be um, appropriate. Now, this is patient with hemoglobin of less than 13 that we're going to have cardiac surgery. And this patient who had a uh, ferret in more than 100, then they check the CRP. In Europe, they check the CRP as a marker of iron deficiency, as a marker of inflammation. If the CRP was high, they gave a gram of IV iron. If the ferret was less than 100, they gave 20 milligrams per kilo. What you want to see, this is the, the transition for top. No transition one unit, two units, or three units. You can see the people who were not transfused, the people who respond to the treatment have almost very similar outcome than the non-anemic patient. And the people who require more than three units, the non-anemic patient and the people who respond to transfusion, they have very similar outcomes. So basically, by optimizing anemia before surgery, you can actually improve the outcome and minimizing the exposure to allogenic blood. This is a nice summary of all different surgical populations. And there's plenty of studies out there. All of them will give you very much the similar information. So I summarize it with this slide. In colorectal surgery, screening and giving IV iron decreases transition rate by 50% and the down the, down the streamline cost by $2,600. In orthopedic surgery, you cut down transition rate by 30%, decrease length of stay by almost two days, and decrease infection by one third. Now, moving into non-surgical patients, perhaps the single population where iron has been used the most, IV iron has been used the most, is heart failure population. If you talk with your heart failure specialist, they will tell you that right now, treating iron deficiency with IV iron is a burning platform. It's something that everybody's doing. And you can see that among people who get IV iron, there's a decrease in the rate of death hospitalization um, and death from cardiovascular causes and all causes. Why is this? Well, um, this is a very nice study that was just published a few weeks ago in ESC heart failure. And basically, they explain that when they do a cardiac MRI or muscle MRI, as well as uh, electronic microscopy, in the patient with iron deficiency anemia, there's restriction of the myofibrils and also there's a decrease in the concentration of mitochondria. When you replace iron on this patient, there's a repletion of mitochondrial function. So this is a fast, this fascinating story that we don't really often stop to think the rationale for optimization. Now, not everything can be as clean and as easy as we would like it to be. The PREVENT trial came up in September 2020, and they basically assess a patient undergoing elective abdominal surgery. And they found that the repletion of IV iron did not change the rate of transition of death as patients who received placebo. Nonetheless, among the IV iron patients, there was a 40% decrease in the rate of readmission, and at six months, like 22% uh, like decrease in the rate of readmission. So there is something that these patients have by using IV iron that has an impact. So the the Word is not final, 
we still have a lot of road to walk. And first of all, not everybody using the IBI island, we still have an opportunity here. And also not everybody optimizes anemia. So we still are, we are still getting data on the long-term impact of using parenteral iron supplementation. So moving to the next section of the talk, fresh frozen plasma. Well, this is the most commonly hemostatic agent is used indiscriminately, up to 60% inappropriately. So when we have a case, this is a cirrhotic patient, the most common clinical scenario where plasma is used milk, scorpion, has fever, and ascites. He needs a paracentesis, is 1.9. How many units of plasma should we use? Two, three, four, or none. What we need to understand is when we look at the INR, the INR is going to tell us a percentage of clotting factors that are circulating in the body. We are going to have all the different clotting factors. Each of them are going to have a percentage. All of them are going to be uniform, uniformly less than 30% when your INR is more than three. You have your real abnormal hemostasis zone. Between two and three, the zone factor will actually be about 30%. But when it is below two, most importantly, below 1.9, you, you will have all your clotting factor will be above 30%. This is very relevant because I see this this is a conversation we have all the time with our endoscopies. Well, INR is 1.8. Give him, give the patient one unit of plasma. Why? Well, because I don't feel comfortable doing this. Well, no. I mean, you're not going to change anything by just giving a unit of plasma, and I, and I will even go further with that. This is starting the MGH um, last decade, and basically, uh, actually, two, uh, almost two decades ago, wow, we are aging so fast now. Uh, patient with INR less than 1.8. And you see that even despite giving the patient four or more units, there's no meaningful changes in the patient INR. Now, this is a study of 7,000 patients and actually had a different values of INRs. Among the people whose INR was between 2 and 2.9, really the change was not that meaningful, but for real, below 1.9, there was no really important change in the INR of the patient. Nonetheless, among whose people's INR was more than three, the change in the INR was more meaningful with plasma replacement. Even more, if they got more than three units, they tended to correct the, the INR in a much effective, in a way more effective way as if they use less volume. Why is that? Well, in medical school, in residency, in fellowship, we don't really get taught how to use plasma. And plasma should be administered in a weight base. So this is the recommendation from the British Society of Hematology. They recommend to use 15 to 20 ml per kilogram and the 9 are more than two to give plasma. So when we have a patient with 60 kilos and you use 12 ml per kilo, um, you're using three units of blood, three units of plasma, um, I mean, you get 12 mil per kilo, three units of plasma. You get 15 mil per kilo, four units of plasma. You don't see here in any value two units of plasma. I was training both in Mexico and then in Metro Health. Oh, get two units of plasma. Why? Because of the way we do, two units of plasma at a time. We never use um, the dose based by weight. But what is the risk of this? Well, number one, we're going to replete the chlorine factors in a much more effective way but we're going to expose the patient to circulatory overload. Therefore, most of the recommendation to use non-transitional methods, if the patient is not bleeding, use vitamin K or use four-factor protromic complex concentrate rather than plasma. Now, what happened with the cirrhotic patient? I was taught cirrhosis equals bleeding. Cirrhosis bleed. Never put them aspirin. Never put them heparin. Do not do VT prophylaxis and cirrhotic. Why? Because they are going to bleed. They are going to bleed to that. Well, AGA recommend VT prophylaxis and cirrhosis. Why? Because yes, you have anticoagulant uh, physiology, but you have a very heavy procoagulant physiology. There's decreasing plasminogen. There's increasing factor eight. 
There's your crazy man by Trumman Cream, Protein C, Protein S. There's your crazy Adam Theater theme. There's the increasing expression of Paul Philebrand factor. So there, we need to understand that the cirrhotic patients are going to be having a balance in both anticoagulant and procoagulant physiology. So our guidelines for, for liver disease, both American and European, do not recommend routine replacement of plasma before a parenthesis. Therefore, this patient should not get any plasma whatsoever. Now, the second clinical scenario where we use FFPs is warfarin-associated bleeding. And the guidelines uh, by HCCP, they still need to be updated, but they recommend to rather use four-factor protromine complex concentrate or vitamin K. Now, we need to understand one thing in patients with warfarin. The liver does not stop synthesizing coagulation factors. Those coagulation factors are going to be there. They are just not active. When you give the vitamin K, you, you provide the final step to render them active with the carboxylation. So if the patient is not bleeding, you can just wait. Just, just give some time to let the, the, vitamin, the uh, vitamin K antagonist levels come down or just give vitamin K. Now, if they are bleeding, if you give plasma, it takes all this time, almost one day to start correcting the INR. When protromine complex concentrates, correct the, the INR almost immediately. Here's another case. This is a patient with uh, end-stage renal disease on dialysis. I have osteomyelitis, need a central line, and INR is, is two. How many units of FFP does the patient need? So I want to show you the Society of Intervention and Radiology Guidelines. In our institution, these are the guidelines that we have used in order to provide the recommendation for, um, for plasma and platelet transfusion. And we see that even for a central line placement, for an IBC filter, LP, all of these done with intervention and radiology, the guidelines do not recommend to check any labs whatsoever. If you have done, they are okay to proceed if your INR range is two to three. Remember what I showed you. Between two and three, some of your chlorine factor will be about 30%, some will be low. But, you, but, but they, they, they let the range to stay there. Probably, I probably would say, I mean, maybe less than two. And plate is more than 20,000. Now, this is for patients who they consider low bleeding risk. In patients with high risk, they recommend more conservative values, INR less than 1.8, and platelet more than 50,000. And this is things like tips or a solid organ biopsy or an nephrostomy. Now, what about the patient with cirrhosis? Well, patient with cirrhosis, if their bleeding risk is low, they don't care what the INR looks like. Meanwhile, platelets are more than 20,000 and fibrinogen more than 100. If the bleeding risk is high, then INR less than 2.5, more than 30,000 and fibrinogen more than 100. So this will be the recommendation. In this case, we would not need to give her any FFPs as they would not check them. So some of the key takeaways so far is avoid arbitrary use of plasma to correct INR. If you have coagulopathy, if you have bleeding, rather use vitamin K or four-factor protromine complex concentrates. And INR less than 1.9, I mean, if you give FFPs, you're going to very unlikely change any outcomes whatsoever. Moving forward with platelets, uh, I, I get every day a report of the blood bank storage. And we have kind of like a traffic like green, yellow, red. And we see in green is we have enough storage of, of, of the different uh, elements. Yellow, we are always uh, borderline red. We are in critical shortage. The one that we are always, kind of always in the yellow in some of the hostile places. Places are very difficult to get. They're very expensive, but also they are stored at room temperature and they have a higher risk for bacterial colonization. This is important to acknowledge um, the risk of infection with platelet juice they cause most of the transitional reaction. I mean, we need to remember, uh, platelets is, are, are the cells that are going to get activated for clotting and for, with inflammation. So they are very pro-inflammatory and we have to be cautious with it. 
And um, when we when use plated, we have different forms to order. We can use a pool of plated. A pool of plated will have five units of platelets, or we can use a furnace that will be just, we have the same volume. It's about 200 mils, 250 mils. So it's not negligible because you also have some on curry power, like a 250 mil bottles there. They rise your platelet count about 20 to 30,000. That's what you expect it to rise when you use this, this um, you a pool of plates. We have different ways of providing it. The conventional way that needs radiation. These are the new ones that are called pathogen reduced, where you do a photoluminescent um, pro, a process, a chemoluminescent process that inactivates pathogen and decreases the rate of graft versus host system. So what happened in the hospitalized patients? Hospitalized patients are under inflammation. They may have sepsis, may have another infection, they may have some sort of inflammatory process going on, and platelets are going to be activated. So especially in the surgical patient, we expect a native on the platelet count by day five. But we also need to account into dilution, pseudothrombocytopenia. So anytime I have a patient with thrombocytopenia, I do check a heat traded platelet count. Why the heat traded platelet count? because I want to make sure this is not pseudo thrombocytopenia where platelet aggregate, and then the culture, that is the machine that counts the platelet, identify them as a single plate when it's just a, a, a bunch of clumped platelets. Immodilution status, and definitely consumption. I mean, platelets are going to be consumed, and, and it's basically just telling you that uh, the body is responding appropriately. Sometimes the hematology, well, the platelets are not coming down, then it may be a, some marker that the, the patient is not uh, responding appropriately to inflammation. So we have a case of a patient needs a IR guided lumbar puncture. Patient has 25,000 platelet counts, and this is uh, and the, the lumbar puncture is done for me, for meningitis. So what should be the platelet number that we need to rise it up in order to do a safe LP? So um, we want to show you that there is no evidence to support central lung infection. This is a study called the PACER trial. They are still recruiting patients, and they're looking for different core of values of uh, platelet count before a line is placed. We use ultrasound nowadays, and um, in reality, there's no evidence to support a specific core of value. We do the estimate. Uh, uh, that the guideline provides. For lumbar punctures, there is also no evidence whatsoever that support a specific platelet count that you need to rise the platelet before a lumbar puncture. However, from the lumbar puncture standpoint, we can use some uh, data we can extrapolate. And this is a story that was done in ACUs in Europe, where they, they had adults that presented within a six hours of having an intracranial hemorrhage topratentorial intracranial hemorrhage. Who have used antiplatelets a week before of the presentation and who were not in coma? And they found that they transfused half of them and provide standard care to the other half. Found that among the patients who were transfused versus standard of care, there were no changes in survival, no changes in the modified ranking score, and no changes in the growth and the size of the hematoma. After, after one day after uh, admission. So what are the guidelines state? Well, they recommend, number one, whenever you transfuse, use one unit. I mean, one pool will have five units of platelets or one unit of asparagus platelets. They will rise your plate by 20 to 30,000. And they consider different thresholds to transfusion. Spontaneous bleeding, 10,000. Central line, 20,000. LP, 50,000, the British Society recommend 40,000, major operation, major surgery, 50,000, and neurosurgery and ophthalmology, 100,000. Now, if we recall, the Society for Intervention in Radiology, they recommend uh, not to check plates and plates more than 20 is okay for a central line. It's okay for a lumbar puncture. Now, here right, they recommend 40,000 or 50,000, but intervention in radiology, they say, 20,000 is fine. So this patient is already more than 20,000, does not need platelets. Now, let me tell you a caveat. And you tell me, well, we are going to do this procedure blindly at bedside. Blindly at bedside, 
you know what? I will go with the British Society. I will get 40,000. So I probably will transfuse this patient. I will give the platelet. And the way I will do it, I will give the platelet just right immediately before I am doing the procedure. And even start the procedure when some of the platelets are still dripping down in the tubing. Why? Because those platelets will be actively circulating and will mitigate my risk of bleeding. That's a good strategy to use it. So give the platelets right away. I will not check platelets afterwards. I will just leverage the platelets that are being used um, in this case. Now, uh, I don't know how many of you are in Twitter, but there's a, uh, I, I will show uh, Nick Mark from the University of Seattle. He has, he just published last week, a very nice um, algorithm, and very nice images on using ultrasound for lumbar puncture. So this is a good resource to use. So you're not going to be blind anymore. Even we can use focus for that. Now, definite contraindication for platelet hit or ICP. Absolutely, you will never use platelets in that setting. Now, a teaching point about HIT is whenever you're having a patient who you are treating for a deep venous thrombosis or you're anticoagulating, always look at the platelet count. I had a case this about 11, 12 years ago where the platelet count of the patient were 300. The patient had a very bad upper extremity DVT that was getting worse and was developing a very bad post phlebitis syndrome right away. And we could not understand. So when we check at the platelet, the platelet before admission were 700. So the patient got normal platelets of 300, but in reality, the patient got hit. So we stopped to buy valeridine and things actually improved and we decreased the thrombosis burden. So it's important to acknowledge that hit does not necessarily mean platelets is less than 100. Heat can happen, you can have plates of 400. If your baseline were 800, that's 50% decrease. So always look at the, at the baseline plate of value. Now, I have told you that for anemia, you can optimize iron, you can optimize B12, you can optimize folic acid, you can optimize zinc. For uh, when you have coagulopathy, for clotting factor, you can give vitamin K. You can use for uh, for factor protonomic complex concentrates. What about platelets? If you have a patient who does not want to receive platelets, the Jehovah Witness, they say absolutely not. Well, you can give DDAVP. DDAVP will release the subendothelial deposit of foam bilibran factor and increase platelet addition. Definitely, you can use thrombopoietin mimetic, aromiplostim, and thrombopax for Definitely, as we have already said, sepsis, right? The create inflammation, decrease, decrease inflammation of the endothelium, treating the sepsis, maybe giving statins on patients too. We can use recombinant factor seven, fibrinogen concentrate, recombinant factor 13. You can use anti fibrinolytic agents. So there's other things that we can do to optimize coagulopathy in our patients that does not require transfusion. And this is important because we always have to be creative when the patient is refusing to get transfusion, what is what we should do to optimize them uh, without exposing them to cell. Now we keep changing, we keep evolving. I really want to give a shout out to our good friends from the Society of Hospital Medicine. This is a paper done by our good friend, Dr. Andre Mansour from the University of Oregon. And this is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful manuscript just published last month. And they summarize all the recommendations um, for uh, optimizing coagulopathy and antithrombotic agent in the different bedside procedures. So it's a nice paper to download. Um, it's a great resource. It's an easy read and uh, it's very well edited. So I really want to um, shout, uh, give a shout out to our hostelist colleagues. Now, what about the assessment of coagulopathy? Well, first of all, a lot of places are not using APTT anymore to monitor heparin. They use anti tna levels. A lot of places, um, they use a thromboelastogram and rotatory thromb thromboelastometry. This is most commonly used within the clinical scenario of cirrhosis. This is the most common scenario where they basically look at the geometry of a clot formation and thrombolysis, and based on the different elements, 
you can actually find out what would be the best recommendation. Either use plasma, cryos, platelets, use the ADP, use antifibrinolytics. So, and this is Nick Marks. This is the, you can, I, I, I got this one from him. And this is the gentleman I was telling you from Seattle that publishes this wonderful, wonderful one pagers. And he, he just publishes one pager on uh, lumbar puncture uh, guided by POCO. So I would definitely recommend you to visit him and, um, and get the one pager since there's no cost whatsoever. So we keep evolving. We need to take creative. And uh, with it, I conclude my presentation. Uh, we have 14 minutes uh, to go, and um, I'm open for your question and comment. And you can throw the virtual tomatoes too. Thank you so much for that. That was great, and uh, I really appreciate it. Let's open the floor for comments. Uh, maybe people can unmute themselves or enter them in the chat, whatever people want. While we're waiting, maybe we'll go back to one of the first slides you showed, the one you said was the most important um, algorithm. Because I always love it when there's a box that just says call PCP or whatever, send patient back to PCP. Oh, so oh, I wondered oh, if I, you I, could I, elucidate I a little more. Uh, yeah, absolutely, uh, no. Here we go. What, uh, what the goal was there. Yep, that one. I mean, the, the, the greatest thing of this algorithm is like help you, help you to, to, uh, to engage the team. I mean, one of the words that we're using now in the Cleveland Clinic is, is that this is the favorite word of our leadership. It's called systemness. Systemness, systemness for anything. And the systemness is engaging the whole system as a whole, because we tend to think in silos. We have a very fragmented approach to medicine. So this is a very nice uh, thing because it definitely engages uh, having all different uh, colleagues and, and, and make sure they engage the, con the conversation. As a whole, it's not just basically going to have a hip replacement, therefore we'll just focus on the hip replacement and patient follow up and, and nobody follows up on things. So thank you for bringing that up. Thanks. Other folks, Dr. Berger. Yes, Moises, thank you so much for the amazing talk that covered so many different topics. Um, to go back to sort of your first topic and a long time passion of mine, it's sort of iron repletion. So you, dealt, you did talk about the anemia and then you also talked about um, just like the benefit on cardiac surgery and, and sort of functionality. In the literature on that, because it's coming up in the CHF literature around replacing iron, in the literature around the perioperative sort of management of iron deficiency, are they starting to talk about how iron not only affects our hemoglobin, but is also a large component in our muscle and um, cardiac muscle particularly? Um, how much do they delve into that for when everyone goes and looks at all your references and go, oh my goodness, look at this other good stuff that iron can do to help us? Well, this is just building up right now. I mean, we're getting most of the data right now from the heart failure literature. Um, and, um, and actually from the cardiac surgery. So uh, right now, um, it is just people have been focusing in a very concrete way just on the hemoglobin value. So we're, we're still developing that, uh, that question. I mean, the, the question you're asking is a reason to just do a research right now. Thank you. I have a Welcome. question. Thanks for the question. Yes, sir. Hi, Moises. Thanks again. Great to see you. And thank you so much uh, for, for such an outstanding talk. I mean, you mentioned this concept of systemness, and I was wondering if you could if you could elaborate a little bit on, you know, from your perspective in the inpatient setting, you know, what are the most important structural 
components for a successful blood management program? What are the most important relationships? Because as you know, for example, as as hosp if as hospitalists, you know, if we have one approach, but you know, our colleagues in hematology have another approach and the surgeons have their own ideas, you know, then there can be, you know, lots of agreement, but there can also be, you know, points of contention. So how do you go about, how, how do you go about creating like a shared mental model on, you know, what the approach is? I would imagine it's more than just emailing out a policy, you know, I mean, do you, how do you build those relationships to, so that it translates into, you know, teamwork? No, the, the question is fantastic, uh, and that basically touch on the on the point of system. We have to educate and uh, gather the team as a whole and engage the team. It is about engagement. I think it's often a situation where we have those conversations in a siloed way, and what we have to do now is talk all all the team together. So approaches is, for instance, you, you invite the chair of hematology. The chair of the blood bank, the chair of force. Which which one is your service line from surgical standpoint that is the highest blood utilizer? Invite that chairman. <laughs> Invite that chairman, and um, and of course your leadership. I mean, from our system, that we are getting the support. I mean, we have we create a governance structure for blood management, and above me is the chief of staff. So she's supporting me and providing me the backup to be able to engage the other team. So when I call the other guys to meet together, we have the support from the leadership. So getting the buy-in from the leadership is key to support systemness. And, uh, and definitely talking all together at the same time and looking at the data in real time and being able to establish some benchmarks. I mean, people start moving moving along. I mean, one of the things, um, as you told me, you, you asked me, is we're trying to engage the outpatient doctor. It's hard for me to tell them, well, guys, you don't optimize an image. What do you mean? Well, every time I get a patient that's coming for surgery, I look at the charts. And you have been documenting since 2017, anemia stable, anemia stable, anemia stable. I mean, but you never approach it. So it becomes a feedback. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, I hope I, answer, I have to answer the, the question. Yeah, that was great. We have two more minutes, maybe time for one more question. I'm replying a text to um, Dr. Mitaka. Yes, thank you. So just uh, like, uh wanted to like ask if like we can like upload the like recording to our internal YouTube. Absolutely, page. yeah, 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 by all means. Yeah, I forgot to ask yeah. Yeah, beforehand. Well, like, like, like Tony Bruce says, like the TP Solver says, the court of either democracy of education, right? So I feel like the sort of reverse of some of what you said or the the uh, other way of looking at it is some of the research that's been done around blood donations. And I, my sense is that it's sort of mixed, right? They used to say that like, if you donate blood that lowered your risk of heart disease. And then I think more recently, there's been some, some sort of uh, mixed studies on that. I mean, as a primary care doctor, should I, is there advice for my patients on, on uh, the health benefits or not of donating blood in a, in the, theory that it reduces your iron stores. Yeah, no, no, I, I mean, here's the deal. Um, healthy patient will be healthy. I mean, you have a healthy diet, healthy activity, you don't know, you, I mean, you should be okay. I think donating blood is one of the best things people can do. I mean, it's a very altruistic thing. You help to support our blood banks. You help so many patients. I mean, being a blood donor is a true blessing. I mean, you're an angel on earth. <laughs> So I would always advocate for blood donation. Uh, we never want to be um, out of blood in the blood bank. Um, I mean, if you have a healthy diet, you donate one unit every couple months, you should be okay. It should not deplete your iron stores. Now, uh, if you have somebody who has um, elevated iron stores, I mean, you have some some patient that I, I 
they asked me to do an iron um, tour measurement because they, the brother had heterozygous hemochromatosis. The guy had 400. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I, he can probably donate every month and should be okay. Great. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, no. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Have a great day. Hey, Dr. Riz, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you, Alfred. Thank you, Dan. Uh,